elephant scale well beyond Toastmasters. That's the point of this slide. Next one, Abhijit. Thank you, Abhijit. So, um, and why is it so difficult? A number of reasons. <clears throat> As human beings, we struggle with uncertainty. Um, we like to know what's in front of us. We like to know what's coming. I mean, just think of our world today where COVID is rewriting so many rules, not just in our families or in our communities, in our counties, in our state, in our country or across the world. And that uncertainty creates so much anxiety for us. And anxiety disables our brain. Sometimes when we're stressed, we just cannot connect with those thoughts. We can't express ourselves clearly. We are maybe have some great thoughts to, to impart, but stress disables that. Time, of course, is another issue in impromptu speaking. It'd be wonderful if, if in table topics, if you ask me a question and I can say, let me get back to you in 15 minutes with my thought on that. Yeah, that would be a luxury, would it not? But that's not the case. You have to basically marshal your thoughts and speak almost immediately. And I have a lot of belief that, that, that the notion that we have to perform either in our professional lives or in Toastmasters when we're asked an impromptu question is a disabler. That notion that we're, 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 we shake with fear, we have that, that feeling of nausea, that anxiety feeling, and, it, and we think we have to perform and we lose sight of something that's very basic, which is coming up in the next slide, I hope. <laughs> oh no, not really. Some thoughts around dealing with anxiety that, that work for me. And I've started this a number of years ago, particularly around making presentations at, to customers. Let's take that as an example. And what I do in my own mind is I visualize that meeting. I know who the attendees are, in my mind, I see who's sitting where, and I say to myself, what question might that individual ask? And if you do your research, you can pretty much get a good handle on what people are interested in giving you a topic. And that notion of visualization helps me because I've, when I go into the real meeting, I feel I've been there before. So whether it's in the real world doing an interview or whether it's in table topics, visualize yourself being successful. I find that works. Visualize what, how you'll, maybe you'll take a breath, maybe you'll just relax. Those type of techniques should help you. Next slide, please. Now, for most of us in the top left-hand corner, we can talk to individuals. We meet somebody, we can have a conversation, it seems natural. However, when you put eight people or 10 people or 15 people together, for some reason we feel, oh my goodness, I'm being assessed. I'm under, I, need to, I need to present my best side. That's not the case and that's not the mental model I suggest you think of it. Just think of it as a conversation with more people. Now, what helps me in table topics is I look at somebody like Andy Keats, who is a friendly guy, despite the fact that he's English. I will look at Andy and I will make eye contact and I will talk to Andy and that creates that notion of a conversation and then I move to Elena or Abhijit or whoever. Think of impromptu speaking as having a conversation with a number of different individuals. I find that's helpful. Get it into your mind and believe it. How do we buy time? Classic case is to pause. I tell the story that I, in my um, last table topics contest, I got to the district level in 2016. I did not place actually. But I note that the number one and the number two placed winners, one of the guys paused for 10 seconds. The other guy paused for 15 seconds. And what they used that time for was to think, to compose themselves, and then speak. So many of us, when we're asked a table topic, 
question, we stand up and we immediately start to, to speak. And sometimes when we're speaking for about 30 seconds, we'll say, now, what was the question you asked me? So clearly there is a different approach. Pause, give yourself time, think about the question, think about the techniques that I'm gonna show you later on. And I think you'll be in a better, in a better position. You can uh, also, to buy some time, ask somebody to repeat the question. I don't favor that myself because it, it's indicative that perhaps the person is not listening. But nonetheless, in impromptu speaking, all is fair in, as in love and war. Create the time by perhaps asking the, the, the person to repeat the question. Ask a question yourself. You, for instance, somebody would say, well, what do you think COVID means? To the planet. Oh, you, you might say, well, COVID, what does it mean to us personally? What does it mean to our communities? What does it mean to our churches? What does it mean to our work environments? And as you ask those questions, use your mental processes to think how you'll respond to the, to the, to the original question. So that's a technique that buys you a little bit of time. And I, Certainly, as I indicate here, you can go back to the previous question. The point about impromptu speaking and table topics in Toastmasters is that you need to practice and get comfortable. And if you need to go back to a previous question that you have a better opinion, that's fine. The point is learn to stand up, uh, to react extemporaneously, even though in that case you might have had a few minutes. The important thing is to do that. And, or even change the question. That's a wonderful question about COVID, but what it brings to mind is some of the, whatever, just switch, pivot to a topic, and then come back to, to the COVID question at the end. Buy yourself some time by pausing, by asking a question, by pivoting, whatever. Next slide. Now, let's come to the framework. And the framework for me is, there's four boxes on this, we'll see it eventually. But initially, the, the point I want to make to you is listen. Toastmasters always tells us that we should become better listeners, but it's nowhere more evident in my mind, it's, it's nowhere more relevant than in, with this topic. Please listen to the question. I suggest to you that when you listen to a question, there is a path forward in that question, and I'll hopefully illustrate that when I show you the techniques that I, I, I offer. But it is really important. In the real world, I interview a lot of engineers. And I can tell you, you know, I, one question I typically ask is, well, tell me how your prior experience helps you or positions you for the job that we have an offer. I have to tell you that maybe one out of three, one out of four engineers will say, they'll tell me about the patents they have filed and all the good things they've done, but they'll fail to make the connection to the job that we're hiring. And I'll ask that question a second time. And if they don't get it then, I probably won't ask it a third time. So listen carefully to the question. Can't emphasize that enough. Then I want you to decide on a couple of options. Now let's go to the next slide, Abhijit. So here are the ideas that we have, and I'm gonna take them from the top left, left to right. Let's say you're asked the question, uh, is crying a sign of weakness or strength? Is crying a sign of weakness or strength? I suggest to you, Here's a question that immediately lends itself to the agree or disagree framework. So what I'm offering you here is frameworks that help you respond. I agree that crying is not a sign of weakness because A, B, C. Pretty straightforward approach. I, or I agree that it is a sign of weakness, and I don't like to show that because of A, B, C, whatever. So think of that agree, disagree mental model. Next one to the right is pros and cons. So the question would be, would you break the law to help out a loved one? Would you break the law to help out a loved one? Pros and cons. Well, on the one hand, I would break the law to help a loved one get out of a difficult situation. My friends are important to me. I'd like to stand up for them. 
On the other hand, the con of that is that I might end up in jail. Think of it on the one hand, on the other hand, pros and cons. Does the question lend itself to that? Hopefully by the, when we get to the role play, you'll see that the third mechanism that I have or technique is very helpful. It's called the PREP technique, it's an acronym. It means point, reason, example, and point again. So the classic question that fits into this model in my mind is the question, do you agree with climate change? Do you agree with climate change? So the point I'm gonna make is yes, I agree with climate change. The reason, which is the second point here, the reason is because 97% of the world's scientists are aligned around the change that, the, the notion that our environment is changing. Give some examples of your point. Well, of course, we've got the raging fires in California, we've got the tsunamis and the flooding in Asia, and we've got wildfires in Brazil whatever. And then finish up by the point, with a point again. Yes, for all the above reasons, I believe in climate change. So you find, I suggest, that this particular mental model is very helpful and very applicable. Moving down to the, uh, to the right-hand corner, the goal, what is titled goal, one question uh, that to me fits with, with this, or is a good fit for this, would be, would you ever consider running a marathon? Well, oh, actually, I would consider running a marathon. I know running 26 miles is an arduous task to, to most of us, except for people like Abhijit, who is an Ironman contestant. But if I was to run a marathon, I'd break it down into goals. I would say, well, my initial goal would be to run a 5K, and then I'd step up to a 10K, and then I'd step, I'd prepare. In other words, break the topic into stages, and then that structures your thought logically, and you'll come across as incredibly coherent, even though I have never run a marathon and I never will. I much prefer to drive it. Okay, cause and effect is the next tool that I suggest you, you use. Which activities, for instance, would you su suggest make you lose track of time? I'm inspired by Andy's background that I saw at the beginning of this session. He had, an, he had a beautiful garden. So what activities make me lose the track of time? It's going out in the garden. Because what I find when I go to the garden in Silicon Valley, what happens in the garden is so much more different. It could not be more different than my life in technology. In technology, we're always trying to get new products to the market quicker. But in the garden, things take their own time. Nature dictates the pace. And there's an example of where you link cause and effect. The effect is what causes you to lose track of time. Oh, that some of the causes are your hobbies, what you like to do. So think of that, that's uh, also a technique that might help you. And then lastly, in the, in the left-hand corner, another technique, another mental model that I always find exceptionally helpful to me. And that is the notion of, uh, you know, time, a timeline, past, present, and future. Uh, Tell me about a time, here's a question. Tell me about a time when you were really angry. Let me use that model. Well, in, when I was a teenager, I, I was angry at my parents, I was angry at my teachers, I was angry at whatever. But as I've got older and as I've approached the present day, I have a much better philosophy on life. And there's really not that much that is worth getting angry about. So you can, you can suggest, you, or you can tie your, your responses to, to the notion of, uh, of time. And it allows you to tell micro stories, okay? Micro stories. Next slide. So once you have decided on the technique that you want to use, then I suggest the next thing you need to do is quickly organize that speech in your head. And I recommend simplicity at all times in impromptu speaking, in the workplace and in Toastmasters. So when you're asked the question, make your point, make an opening statement if it's a as a response. Think of your response 
than in the body. One or two justifications, reasons, anecdotes from your past that complement your logic and then finish up with a conclusion. So just use the techniques that you've learned actually at the icebreaker speech in Toastmasters, an opening, main body, and a conclusion, and keep it simple. Then lastly, the last thing you need to do is express yourself clearly. Uh, and assuming that you've done a great job on the first three elements of this framework, you can either be really successful with the expression or not. So here's what to me makes sense around this. And I'm going to give you a do, something that you should do and something that you should not do. Let's start with the you should not do. So many times when people are asked impromptu questions, they ramble. They string their sentences together. Well, I don't know about climate change. I'm sometimes confused because there's so much in the media about what's happening, but I think that when I read certain articles, this happens, but then the politicians say this, and you know, next thing the person is just rambling. And, and I love those rambles because in the middle of it, they'll probably say, what is the question again? So what you should do is Try not to ramble, and the best way I know of stopping that is say very simple, short sentences. I believe in climate change for these reasons. Here are the examples. Keep it short, keep it simple, and that actually focuses your mind and prevents you from rambling because each sentence is naturally inclined to be a standalone thought. The, the suggestion that I have then, the second suggestion is what you should do is in table topics, or in, it, it, every question has been asked before. Every single question has been asked somewhere in table topics in the entire world. There's nothing unique about it. What you, can ha what you have the opportunity to do is make the answer unique by telling a personal story. For example, Andy might take my example of earlier, and he might talk about why his garden is so important to him and what benefits he get from it, and it reminds him of this. Or if we're talking about, um, you know, is crying a sign of weakness or strength? Well, uh, you know, may perhaps delve into something that made you cry that is very personal in your life. Because when you tell personal stories, it's very authentic, and people engage with you and they listen to you, and you'll be successful in communicating with them. So we around the expression is don't ramble and try and bring something personal to the table because that makes it unique. Right. Now we're going to do some role play. And uh, perhaps, um, Abhijit, if you could get me back to where I can see everybody. Hey. Now, um, and we can perhaps everybody uh, go off mute. Actually, Abhijit, I do have a request. Perhaps put up the, uh, the framework again. Um, I beg your pardon. Let me do that. Yeah. yeah, if you just show that, either from the one page or from the main presentation, whatever you like. Okay. Thank you. It is so great to have Abhijit helping me with this thing. Yeah. No, sorry, the, the, the next slide, um, Abhijit. Oh, yeah, the next slide, yep. Next one. All right, people. So these are the uh, techniques. So I'm going to ask you a question and um, just think about it uh, momentarily. Which of these questions, which technique would you use? And I don't expect you to answer the question, but Abhijit, if you can maybe, if somebody can give a signal, because I'm just looking at, uh, uh, at myself and the, 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 the chart. Uh, let's see if somebody has some ideas. So my question is, which technique would you use for this question? The question is, three weeks of vacation should be mandatory in America. Three weeks of vacation should be mandatory in America. Who'd like to to offer, which technique would you choose for that question? Any takers? I'll go. Andy. 
I would start with agree or disagree because it is a question, do you agree or disagree? But then, then you can go on to, I disagree because, and you can go into the, the pros and cons, but I, I would just take the question as asked, do you agree or disagree and confront it right there and then give my reasoning pros and cons. And, you know, maybe that's also the prep. You make your point. I disagree. Here's the reason. Here's an example. And then at the end you say, I disagree. So it could be a combination, but I'd like to take the question as asked and give the answer and then the reasoning. Andy, that's perfect. Uh, because in the question actually was embedded through there's an implicit do you agree or disagree and Andy immediately went to that and and then offered that you can combine uh, other uh, other elements so great great example uh, Andy next one I'd like you to um, to think about which, which would you use if you had to change your career what profession would you pick if you had to change your career, if you had the opportunity to change your career, what alternative profession would you pick? Any takers on that? I, I can take that. This is, hey guys, this is Chintan here. Uh, I would go with uh, breaking down into goals. Uh, uh, let's start with a uh, with smaller goal. If, uh, if I want to go into the career, how I would go about it before I change, set a goal six months, one year down the line, and then talk about larger goals. So that's how I would take that. This question. That's a great example. <clears throat> and I like the way uh, there was a sense of a personal element to that, uh, Shintan. And, you know, other people would sometimes say prep is a good uh, tool there. Um, if you had to change your career, I would, I'm an engineer. If I had to change my career, I would go to marketing because here are the, here are the reasons I would go to marketing and then, you know, or whatever. So, so multiple, this is a good idea that multiple uh, frameworks uh, or techniques uh, are suitable. Okay. Um, why is your personal story worth telling? Why is your personal story worth telling? Which technique would you use? Um, can I go? Of course. Uh, so usually in most of my speeches, I talk about personal stories. And uh, the reason why I do it is because cause, I, I would choose cause and effect. Why it happened? Cause why did I do it? And the effect, what happened because I actually did it. If I, I have most of my uh, evaluations that I get from my peers, they tell that they like my personal stories because uh, I, I'm happy that you told me that if you tell personal stories, you would be authentic. So that it's authentic and it's real. It's easy for me to express. Really, really well said. Well said, uh, bringing in the ideas on expression and personal stories into your, that's really good. Um, let's have one more before we, uh, let's go for a straightforward one that we've all heard a hundred times before. Tell me about your favorite hobby. Now, let's see some creativity around the choice of technique here. Tell me about your favorite hobby, which technique? And show. Yes. So I would, I would go ahead with the uh, including a past, present, future story, uh, along with some prep, like why I have, uh, why I have a particular hobby, and how it relates to my past, and or maybe future goals, and maybe give some example how it's helpful for me, and then come back to it, saying that this is why I love it. Yeah, again, we're on the same page. When I'm asked that question, I always go to the timeline because I go back to my past, the hobbies I had growing up in Ireland as a child. 
mm -hmm. and as an early uh, as a student uh, those hobbies and then transitioning and you're weaving in elements of personal stories throughout so perfect great thank you now comes the hard part people because now i'm going to ask questions and somebody is going to choose a technique on their feet a, a, a technique and then i'm going to ask you to answer the question so this is more like the classical table topics approach um let's leave the the techniques uh, visible um abhijit so sounds so, good you know. so great thank you abhijit so I'm going to go back to some um, famous people and exercise some quotations that they've made. And uh, given that uh, Andy is on the call, I want to um, start with my, one of my favorite Englishmen, actually, which is very strange coming from somebody from Ireland. <laughs> he said in around the summer of 1940, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Who do you owe the most to in your life and why? Who do you owe the most to in your life and why? Chetan, you want to go? Uh, yeah, so I just joined a couple of minutes ago, so I'm not fully aware of the context, but uh, listening to a few people around, uh, I think, I think I'll go with the prep. So uh, I need to make a point and I need to uh, state the reason and I need to give example. So uh, uh, basic, I'll be, uh, basically go with saying that uh, uh, I owe most of the stuff, um, most to my parents first uh, for raising me right, for being available uh, with me uh, throughout my uh, life. And uh, uh, I can reach out to them anytime, anywhere I want. Uh, and secondly, I would say I owe so much, like I owe the most to the society because anytime, whenever I uh, faced uh, some troubles or problems, I had someone who uh, who came forward and helped me out. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. And again, just as a reminder, you don't have to describe the process. This is the real world. We're, we're, we're now role playing in the real world. Don't tell me the technique. Choose it and then answer the question that you're asked. Um, Steve Jobs, during the 1995 commencement address to Stanford graduates said, find the courage to follow your heart and your intuition. Find the courage to follow your heart and your intuition. Why is that so hard for us as human beings to do? Why is that so hard for us? Since uh, Abhijit cold called me last time, I can give it a try. <laughs> uh, most of us as humans have the ability to think about the past and the future. Unlike animals who live in the present, who uh, care about the next meal or uh, to run away from somebody who is attacking them, uh, we tend to think uh, across a broader uh, portion of time. And this impacts each and every decision that we make. And that's where I feel that people are risk covers because they think about the negative consequences in the future, as well as they think about their past and uh, how comfortable their life is. And they, uh, that tends to prevent people from taking risks. But living in the present is a way uh, people can avoid uh, doing that and take more risks and achieve greatness like Steve Jobs did. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a question that I asked. I was Table Topics Master in the Table Topics District Competition last November. 
and I had the opportunity to choose the question and I'm going to give it to you now. In your life, this is Robin Williams, in your life, you are given only a little spark of madness. Don't lose it. You're only given a little spark of madness. Don't lose it. What is your spark of madness? What is your spark of madness? Let's have some fun with this, somebody. Krutseka, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. What is my spark of madness? I think uh, everyone is born. I'll go with, oh, I shouldn't tell you, but then past, present, future. Everyone as kids, I think we are a lot more bolder and a lot more braver. At least growing up as a young kid, I did not have too many qualms about saying what I had on my mind or uh, doing what I wanted to do in the moment. But I think over time, things have changed and you become a little more mature, unfortunately. And that is, uh, I think, one spark that I feel I've missed is uh, being able to just dance on the spot. If I find some good music going on anywhere and I would just burst into a dance wherever, whenever. I think that is something I realized I've lost over time just because I'm like, oh, good music. I'll just tap my foot and in my head, I'm dancing. So I think over time, I would like to get that back and go back to just enjoy the music wherever it is and keep Great. the dance and yeah. Hey, Abhijit, let me do a time check. How much time do we have left? 30 more minutes, 32. Oh, then we, then we have much more opportunity here to have some more fun here. Um, would you like to bring world peace or solve world hunger? Which would you prefer to do? Bring world peace or solve world hunger and why? Link, do you want to go? Daxin, do you want to go? Marlin, you can go. Me? Yes. Do you see, Mar do you see Marilyn? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Marilyn. Good to see you. Declan. Well, I would, I would go for world peace. The reason I would go for world peace is I think it would solve both problems. In order to have peace, you have to be comfortable with yourself. And once you're comfortable with yourself, you can help other people become comfortable. And if you can provide that to somebody else, if you can take somebody who has some anxiety about whatever, world issues or personal issues, and they become peaceful, there's a connection. You just gave them a gift and you have that connection. And if you imagine that peace and that connection spreading from each individual out to other individuals, then from one country to another country. And everybody has been blessed. Everybody has been changed. Everybody has been transformed. I don't think one of those people would say, I don't want to give this to somebody else. Everybody would want to pay that forward and hunger would be one of the natural things that would be answered. Excellent, Marilyn. Thank you very much. Delighted that you were chosen for that question. Now I have a question. I'm going back to Winston Churchill. He said, we have always found the Irish to be a little bit odd. They refuse to be English. Do you find, do you find the Irish to be a little bit odd? Mohammed, do you want to go? If Andy is still online, let's hear what Andy has to say. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, go ahead.
सोनिया डी यू वॉन्ट यू गो Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know. I can. I can go next. If you can pick someone up, then I'll go next. If that's okay. Oh, okay. Maybe this is a, such a difficult question. I I could answer this one myself. I do not find the Irish to be odd in the least. The rest of you are odd, as far as I'm concerned. Um. Next question is. Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference in our lives. Attitude is a big thing, is, excuse me, is a little thing that makes a big difference in our lives. Where has a positive attitude helped you the most in your life? Where has a positive attitude helped you most in your life? I can take that one. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. I believe a positive attitude can help you in a lot of different situations. Personally, a place where a positive attitude has helped me has been when I was at uh, at university, a graduate student. And what I liked to do then was interact with a lot of different people. And in one of these situations, uh, I was uh, talking to a few friends of mine who unfortunately had uh, had not been able to answer the questions in the exam correctly. And what I did was just motivate them a little bit. And even I was impacted because these were things that we did not know of and the questions came as a surprise. But what I told them is, the questions, the exam, it's not an exam of who we are as a person. So we need to be positive. We need to trust our own intelligence and we need to understand that an exam, an examination, a degree doesn't define us as human beings, you know, as what we are. It doesn't define our personality. Luckily, the little bit of common sense that we had used, it helped us pass and sail through the exam. But while I had friends around me who were breaking down, a little bit of upbeat and positive attitude helped me and them. Great, great. Now I'm gonna ask one last question. Thank you very much, Sonia. One last question before we go to the Q&A. So uh, let's see who would like to, to to answer this question, would you be, prefer to be a child your whole life or to be an adult your whole life? Why? I can take it. Virginia. Yes. I don't know what it is to be an adult because I've been a child my whole life <laughs> and I see everything through childlike eyes. And in fact, even though I'm in my sixties, which is called a sexagenarian, by the way, which throws eyebrows up if you don't know what that means, but inside I have decided I'm 37 and maybe even younger. It just depends. But when it comes to penguins, which I truly love, I am a kid again, or when I, giggle at something that's really funny. I'm a kid again, like picking up my, my heels. Or if I hear some good music and I want to just start dancing and moving, I'm a kid again. So it, it just, there's a disparity between your physical body age and your internal emotional age. And sometimes you're at conflict with that, such as they opened up early for the stores for the seniors to go in. And I thought, okay, I'll have to wait till after this time. And then I realized, wait a minute, I am a senior. I am an old person, but I don't feel it and I don't sense it. So as far as I know, I'm still waiting till I grow up to decide what I want to do. And there isn't going to be enough time to do that. So I think it's just a matter of your attitude of how you are. My dad was born as, a, as an older person. That's just his, his attitude the whole life. And he acted that way. Even as a young kid, he looked forward to retirement. 
And that's all he talked about. So it just depends, I guess, on your attitude. And in my case, I'm happy just being a kid. So I guess it depends on what life has thrown at you. If it has thrown you some really hard knocks, and we've all had hard knocks, sometimes that makes you grow up too fast and you, get, you have to be mature to deal with it. But I've been blessed, even with my hard knocks, to still be able to remain a child at heart. Virginia, wonderful. Wonderful way to finish up uh, the, uh, the, the, the live table topics part of this uh, workshop. You do remind me, I'm just going to inject a personal story. Many of the people on this call or some of the people on this call know I like to talk about my four-year-old grandson. <coughs> We're taking care of him a little bit these days. And uh, he, he, uh, he asked me what age I was. And I says, well, I am actually young. And, and he said, no, you're not granddad, he says. And I said, well, why do you say that? He says, because your face is white, your beard is white. And I said, it's blonde. And he said, no, granddad, it's white. So I'm having that argument myself, Virginia. Okay, let's go uh, back to the presentation, uh, Abhijit, and uh, where we left off. Sounds good. Uh, I'd like to see all the techniques again, essentially, in the, in the main presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to try and wrap up here, um, or not, not wrap up, but, but go to a general Q, question and answer. You know, I, suge I suggest this is, the, is a model that has helped me. It, it de-stresses. It gives me a framework to add some stories around. And um, the idea is that you can absolutely deal with an impromptu question with this mental support, with this mental model support. Um, to, to exercise it, to try it out for yourself at your, at your next Toastmaster meetings, bring a copy of this along. I think Abhijit has already provided it to you, or if you don't have it, he will send it to you. And just glance at this, take a moment, which of these models will help, and over time, hopefully it'll help you with those anxiety issues that sometimes disable us, um, particularly. So with that said, uh, next slide, which is general Q&A. Anything that's unclear, anything that you think is missing, anything that, um, any questions you have about impromptu speaking in general? Love to hear them now. I had a question. So. Um... This is relevant to the topics that you mentioned towards the end. For example, you, uh, one of the topics that you brought up was, uh, do you find anything, uh, I'm paraphrasing, so don't mind the words, but uh, do you uh, find anything weird about Irishmen, right? Uh, but uh, most of us uh, Indians, to be honest, uh, haven't encountered many Irishmen, right? So there are topics like this that come up often uh, where you don't have a clue uh, about what the topic is about. How do you, uh, how do you, what are your suggestions on how we can handle those kind of table topics? Well, you know, in, in some ways, if, if I'm asked a question and it's a subject that I don't uh, know much about, I can actually sit, talk about that. I mean, if you ask me a question about astrophysics, I probably could describe in one or two minutes what I don't know about the subject. But generally, if you go back, maybe Chitan, you missed some of the earlier slides where, where I suggest that if there's a topic that is difficult for you, you just revert to a prior question you heard that you do have an opinion on because the important thing is to exercise your impromptu speaking. So take a, or, and you can pivot to that. I, that question on astrophysics is not a particular subject of mine, but I do have an opinion on um, uh, whatever the prior question is that, that has got your attention. So if you are literally at a stop point because you don't know, pivot to either an earlier question or something related. Please you, force yourself to practice either pivoting or whatever, but speak and address. It's what I suggest. Thank you. Thanks. Those are great tips. Thanks. I have a question, Declan. Actually, two questions. So the 
biggest fears that I have when I do an impromptu speech are one that I may will not be able to come up with a creative idea, you know, to make it interesting. And two, that I might, like you said, ramble or, you know, talk a little bit senseless. So these are the two fears which actually always prevent me from going ahead and, uh, you know, attempting for an impromptu speech. How do you suggest I should overcome them or, you know, work on them? So the first question is, you know, you're stuck. You can't come up with a creative idea. Yeah. Sometimes when people say that to me, uh, Ashil, I think they're trying to be something, they're trying to project something they're not. Mm -hmm. Or they're, they're trying to create something that doesn't feel comfortable for them. So okay. relax. You don't have to invent um, or solve world hunger with every question. You don't have to have that created. Perhaps just tell a personal story. Mm -hmm. Perhaps reflect on the question and why it's challenging. That's the notion that I said at the, at the outset or in the early part of this. Don't think it's a performance. You're not on trial to be the most creative person in the room, to be the most mm -hmm. innovative. Just relieve yourself of that pressure. In terms of the rambling, um, again, my only approach there is to, is to uh, speak in short sentences. Okay. And take pauses between the sentences and actually think. Mm -hmm. Always speak more slowly than you normally do and think. Force yourself to do that. Toastmasters is what people have called a learning lab. Try that technique and show. Mm -hmm. sure. Try it time and time again. And before you know it, you'll begin to take the behavior or the new behavior as your normal behavior because you've done it before and before and before. So, right. Thank you so much, Declan. Good that luck, was really good helpful. Luck good luck with that. Um, so I have a question. Um, whenever I give my speeches now with more with the online uh, setup due to the COVID, I, I often think about, uh, I, I know that we have to be aware of audience awareness is very important when giving a speech. When I see some people some some of the folks and if they don't seem interested i lose my confidence when giving the speech and that will make me forget things or 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 just uh, lose my con confidence so what is your approach and how, how do you advise me how do you advise me on improving myself so, so particularly in this online medium it is challenging i much prefer the in person because the, you can actually interact, you can feel the energy, you can make eye contact and all that. So, but there's the, almost the next best thing, which is online. So when you're speaking, yeah. two things you might want to consider. One is look directly into the camera at all times. It, not, it doesn't give you that feeling of audience engagement, but I can tell you when you do that, the people in the audience feel that you're looking directly at them. Okay. So. So do that. And okay. secondly, if you're distracted by people either writing or looking the other way, do yourself a favor, pin your own video. Just look at yourself. Okay. okay. And assume that that eye contact is causing that engagement with the audience. It's a little bit unnatural, but I can tell you, right. I've coached people in the, in the, at, the, at the contest level for the, for the in, in this particular season where we're going online mm -hmm. and so many experienced speakers didn't look at the camera and it disconnected and once they did that it was transformational okay so, okay why that okay. okay sure thanks and if people thanks. think you're not offering the, the wit and wisdom that's their loss that's the <laughs> thanks a lot. Hey, uh, i have a question go ahead go ahead Concerning buying time, the use of pauses, where is the balance in the length of pause where it's not considered by the O'Connor as something to avoid? Well, the only, the, of course, there's no specific guidelines on this, Pam. But I can tell you, I'm going to go back to my experience. 
in the table topics final in the district level in 2016. As I said earlier, I don't know if you were online for that, the, the first and second place speakers paused, um, I think the first place speaker paused 10 seconds, the second place speaker paused 15 seconds. And 15 seconds to me was a stretch, actually. 15 seconds is a long time. So I'd suggest an order as an order of magnitude, about 10 seconds. But that you'll, if you don't maybe take a deep breath, if you don't think, you, you're not gonna utilize that time. So I would suggest 10 seconds is fine and um, take it from there. Don't worry about the accounting thing. It's, all, it's really about engaging your brain and not being disabled with anxiety and not rambling, all of those things and being coherent and personal. So 10 seconds is my guideline actually. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I had a question. So during uh, table topics, do you, is it considered a good habit to thank the table topics masters for the question before you start or at the end or some, or say thank you at the end? I've heard sometimes that's not a good thing to do. Well, generally uh, when I'm asked a question in table to topics, I like to insult the people. I do not want to thank them for making me miserable. Okay. Uh, no, um, <laughs> more seriously, cr critica. Uh, it um, it's really that's a per personal pr preference. It's it's a pleasant thing to do. Thank you very much for that topic. Uh, I haven't thought about that topic much, but I do appreciate that you've brought it to my attention. You know that you can you use that time by thanking the the table topics master by reflecting on the question by saying it stimulates all these thoughts in your mind and while you're looking at your so yes, use that technique, it's absolutely fine. Okay. I, of course, just love the opportunity to rag on the Table Topics Master, but that's just my style. Okay. okay. Hey, I, uh, I have uh, something to share. So regarding thanking uh, to the Table Topics Master, I do it uh, because that I buy some time uh, while I'm thanking, so that helps me. But I do know that it's not a good practice because you don't want to thank somebody that someone put you in a spot. So. Thanks. Yeah, so again, I like the, 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 the idea that it buys you time. Um, but just remember, uh, people, that, that impromptu speaking in the real world and tabletop is not an exact science. What we're trying to do is get better and leverage any and all opportunities and techniques to get better. Whatever reduces your stress, whatever helps you deal with anxiety, whatever helps you think is fair game. You know, just don't worry too much about best practices. I suggest, that's my, my point, be natural, be yourself. And many of us, it's a very natural thing to thank somebody, so do it. Do it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I have a question. So this is specifically related to something of a shorter version like table topics. Um, most of the times when I use a personal anecdote or something to do with um, my culture and there's a mixed audience, um, it's always challenging to um, like know when to stop or like when I'm giving the context as this, this is what happened. So this is related to the question. And I have only two minutes to give my table topics. It's sometimes very challenging to know when to stop and whether the audience has caught the context or not. So what would be a good recipe as to uh, like how much do you, how much of a context do you give and how much do you stick more to the answer and less to the context? I think this is actually a wonderful question and so relevant because the Bay Area where we all live is a cultural hodgepodge. And there are many things that culturally, there were, were many, there's so many cultures and each one of those cultures is usually deep and has many nuances that, that only if you grow up in those cultures will you truly understand and appreciate. My suggestion is comprehend the audience. Look at the audience. If it truly is multicultural, frame your remarks so that they can be understood by non-experts. Respect the variation 
and the cultural diversity of your audience and they're, and they're not. So, in, and, and this is a great exercise to do, extract from your story, or if you want to give a cultural perspective, explain it in one or two sentences that, are, that will be easily understood and that you don't have to be an expert. That's a challenge and it's a wonderful challenge. So I suggest you have to work at it. You have to respect that not everybody understands those nuances. And if you don't frame it correctly, you will lose some people. And therefore, you haven't done as good a job as you had hoped. Get the culture, respect the cultures, elevate it to a common human level if that's possible. Or if there's something in your culture that is also in Asian cultures or European cultures, frame it, frame it out. Those, that's the way I think about those type of things. I hope that's helpful, but that's just the, we come across that so often in Toastmasters, cultural diversity and, and lack of understanding and depth. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Any more questions? Well, sounds like we're there, uh, Abhijit, is that right? Yes. yes. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm not sure how many people are on the call uh, now, but I want to thank you all individually. Uh, a number of uh, people on the call I, I know already from San Jose uh, Toastmasters. Great to see you. I hope to see you back there soon. But to all of you for spending this time, I want to express my appreciation. This is something that I think is so important for us in life. It's so important for our careers, actually. I wish I had cracked this code for myself, you know, maybe, maybe 30 years ago. But I, I have put some time in it. I hope you can get, you get some value out of it. Practically speaking, take the one page with you to table topics, glance at those techniques. I guarantee you, if you listen to the question, it'll guide you to a technique that will help you think on your feet. That's my personal promise to you. Try it. And if you don't, um, please complain. Send any and all complaints to Abhijit. 